Of the sign of the old world over. It's the poor what gets the blame, while the rich is all the gravy. Now, ain't that a blinking shame? Put out those lights! Schultz! It will be exactly 6.45 and one quarter. Schulz? <laughs> and one quarter. May I present you with this little token of our esteem? For me? Danke schön, danke schön. Oh, uh, just a little going away present. Well, see you around. Fine. 
on, Limburger. Hello, Schultz. I want you to... Oh, is that you, Mert? Quiet summer's night in Newark, New Jersey, a beautiful young woman was fatally stabbed and strangled in her own home. Just find out who killed my daughter. I think I know who did it, and he's killed before. The prosecutor called him the most dangerous defendant he'd ever prosecuted. But there's a catch. To get the proof I need, I have to dance with the devil. He stabs them as he's pleasuring himself. I'm M. William Phelps, best-selling crime author, and I have an obsession. Serial killer, cold cases. Now, nearly 10 years later, investigators say they still need the public's help. For me, it's personal. My sister-in-law was murdered, and her killer has never been caught. These killers are still out there. Their victims deserve justice and just one new clue could make all the difference. I don't have a badge, but I do have something the cops don't have. Someone who understands the dark mind of a murderer. Boy, I'm telling you, nobody can hear her scream. Because he is one. I write about killers. That's my job. And for my research, I reach out to them behind bars. Son of Sam, Danny Hembry, Kristen Gilbert, Gary Lee Sampson. The list goes on. We're talking more than 30 convicted killers. The man now on death row for a three-state killing spree wants a new trial. After Gary Lee Sampson pleaded guilty, he was given the death penalty. Most of them don't talk much, but one of them did. In a letter Snellgrove wrote in New Jersey, he said he gets a strong sexual arousement from seeing a good-looking female become helpless. And he mentally rehearsed strangling girls posing the body in a sexual pose. Ned Snellgrove is serving life in prison after strangling and stabbing two women to death and trying to kill a third. Since 2007, he sent me over 100 pages of letters claiming he's innocent of one of those murders, but I don't buy it. In fact, I think he may be guilty of one more murder he never got nailed for, a New Jersey cold case from 1982 the murder of Jane Goodwin. 
Police in Newark are searching for a killer tonight after a 30-year-old woman was found stabbed to death in her home. For two years, I tried to get the truth out of Snowgrove, but I pushed too hard. And in 2009, he cut me off. Still, I haven't given up. Jane Goodwin's family needs closure. And if Snowgrove won't talk, I'll have to get inside his head some other way. First, I'm consulting with master criminal profiler John Kelly. Matthew, how did you get involved with this fellow? Well, you know I wrote a book about him. So I wrote to him. I want to get inside his head, kind of like you and 13. I wanted to try to get inside Ned's head. Kelly knows what it takes to dance with the devil. For over a decade, he's been talking to a convicted serial killer he calls 13, who shares his insight on murders. My relationship with Snellgrove only lasted two years. Where'd I go wrong? I've interviewed murderers before, right? But I'm just hoping that somewhere down the road, I can get into the mind of the monster. Right, right. Get into the mind of the monster and hook him. You wanted to use him, and you felt that you had an angle, OK? But do you think maybe he was using you? Snellgrove tried to use me, that's for sure, to manipulate me into fighting for his cause. But he never succeeded in taking my mind off Jane Goodwin. I'm looking at one particular murder that he may or may not be responsible for. Jane Goodwin, 1982, found in her apartment in Newark, New Jersey, and her breasts were exposed, and she was stabbed, all right? And I got to find out the why here. We're actually looking at a signature. And this looks like, if I'm correct about Mr. Snellgrove, this looks like Mr. Snellgrove's signature. His work. His work. Because the signature is very ritualistic in the fantasy that the serial killer entertains and ultimately acts on. What does it say about his mind? Well. I mean, you're talking about the mind of a serial killer, so why don't we talk to another serial killer and find out? Kelly uses 13 as a special consultant to get inside the dark minds of murderers. Can 13 help me get into Snellgrove's mind? I've sat in on lots of these calls, but Kelly always does the talking, and I'm fine with that because I know I could never talk so nicely to a killer. Okay, John. How are you? I'm good, man. Good. I'm sorry I missed your calls the last couple of days. I've been on the road. I was only calling to let you know that I'm ready. Cool. You're ready. Yeah, man. All right, it's good. It's all good. I can tell you, my conversations with Snellgrove never went like this. This is uh, my colleague here, M.W. Phelps, big uh, case. He's been involved with this. He's written about it. And uh, this is uh, the one I was telling you about where uh, a victim by the name of Jane Goodwin up around the Newark area was stabbed in the breast. Why is he focusing on having them naked from the waist up, leaving the clothes on from the waist uh -huh. down, you know? He may have a, uh, a fetish on breasts. I knew of a young lady that knew of a guy who liked to have her rub her feet on him as he masturbated. Okay. Which is kind of strange. But, you know, fetish is a fetish. Fetish is a fetish. 13 is definitely on the right track. Snellgrove was known to masturbate at his crime scenes. But I want to know, what drove him to take a victim in the first place? There's some kind of, of trigger there. OK. That really makes him go off and, uh, and just wants to, wants to kill women. That's it.
Both Jane Goodwin and Snell Groves confirmed victims were attractive women with large breasts. <laughs> Could that physical type be his trigger? I have to admit, 13's insight has been useful. But Kelly and I have different ideas on how to talk to a killer. The information is what's important here. I understand He's a piece that. of garbage. I understand that. I understand he is. But let me ask you a question. Would you rather have the information or not have the information? Well, I'd rather have the information, obviously. But, you know, the way we go about getting that information is another thing. I mean, we call the shots with this animal here, OK? Not him. So you want to try and exhibit power and control of course. over a serial killer whose whole M.O. is about power and control. Yeah. And you to let think him know you could do that? Yeah, hell yeah, I could do that. Let, let him know who's the boss. And get him to talk to you? Absolutely. You mean I've done it before. And get him. And you know I've done to, it before. Well, you've done what you think you've done before, but we'll see if you got into the mind of a serial killer or if a serial killer got into your mind. Kelly has a lot of experience with killers, but he's got this one all wrong. I did get into Snowgrove's mind, deeper than he wanted, which is why he cut me off. You see, I've studied Snellgrove closely, and what fascinates me most about him is, if you didn't know the horrific things he's done, you'd think he was just a regular guy. His first known victim was 23-year-old Karen Osman. They dated at Rutgers University in New Jersey until she broke it off. Then, in December 1983, Karen ran into him at a Christmas party. They chatted until Karen decided to leave. Not long after, Ned left too. Later, in Karen's apartment in nearby New Brunswick, Ned's dark urges exploded. He strangled her until she passed out. Arranged her body in a seductive pose. Then he stabbed her more than 10 times in the breast with a steak knife and left her on the bedroom floor where she was found by her family on Christmas Day. They immediately suspected Snellgrove, the jilted ex-boyfriend. But here's the twist. They thought he may have killed Jane Goodwin, too. He was pale and looked sick, and, and, uh, and that would be around the time that Jane was killed. I'm in New Jersey trying to heat up a cold case, the 1982 murder of Jane Goodwin. Jane was 30 when she was stabbed to death in her Newark apartment. Ned Snellgrove worked in the area at that time, and the way Jane was killed matches his known victims. Was Snellgrove Jane's attacker, or is the killer still out there? So here is your notes from reading my book. Right. I'm with Alita Goodwin, Jane's mother. She contacted me in 2008 after reading my book about Ned, looking for more information. And I promised her I'd help find out if Snellgrove killed her daughter. Over the years, tell me what you've learned about Jane's murder. I was told first that she was um, stabbed. And I thought, OK, she walked in the door and somebody stabbed her, you know. But I wanted her to suffer the least pain. And I thought, if that's what happened, thank God she didn't know what happened. But then I found out she was also strangled, and I thought, mm, she suffered. At the time of her death, Jane had been at a new job for two weeks. And she'd been taking a computer course with the company Snellgrove worked for. He was eight years her junior. But he was confident, good-looking, and a real charmer. So oh. it brings up a list. Maybe he and Jane struck up a conversation oh, really? and made plans to catch up later. Oh. Okay. Thanks. 
Jane never mentioned meeting a guy named Ned to friends or family, but she hardly had a chance to, because before she even finished the training course, she was dead. One year later, in 1983, Snellgrove strangled and stabbed his ex-girlfriend, Karen Osmond, exactly the same way that Jane was killed. When she read about the murder, Alita Goodwin reached out to Karen's mother. I wrote to her and said, I really know how you feel, because this just happened to me a year ago. And I said, if, you know, if I can to help you in any way, you know, please contact me. So she did immediately. Karen's mother told Alita she'd always had a bad feeling about Ned Snellgrove. As soon as she heard Karen had been murdered, she suspected him. And after talking to Alita, something terrifying occurred to her. Did Snellgrove kill Jane Goodwin too? Well, the thing that sticks in my mind the most is she said that she saw uh, Ned Snellgrove on um, August 20-something, late August, and that he looked like he had been through something very bad. He looked terrible. He was pale and looked sick, and, and, uh, and that would be around the time that Jane was killed. It's only circumstantial evidence, but it was enough to start Alita on a quest for answers. My hope would be, before I die, to just find out who killed my daughter. I've had people say to me, why do you want to know? Well, maybe you have to go through it to, to understand why. You just have to know. It's so unfair not to. After 30 years, police haven't found enough evidence to tie anyone to Jane's murder. But Alita hasn't given up. It looks like you've done your own investigation, really. Yeah, well, I, I, I assumed that I would have to do my own work because it didn't seem like anybody else could do it. I haven't given up my search for answers either, because I know what it's like to need closure. My sister-in-law, Diana, was around the same age as Jean when she was killed, and her killer has never been caught either. Let me tell you, there's no pain like it. To see that shallow look in Jane Goodwin's mother's eyes, all this woman wants before she dies, to know who killed her daughter. She deserves that much. She deserves to know who took her daughter away from her. I have to try and help her get the truth. So I've come to the scene of the crime, Jane's apartment in downtown Newark. It was right here in 1982. 30-year-old Jane Goodwin found stabbed and strangled to death on her apartment floor. A source that I wish I could say, but a source that is uncontestable told me that blocks from here, Ned's business card was found. Police also found an open bottle of wine and two glasses in the apartment, which means Jane's killer got her to trust him. Exactly what Snellgrove did with his known victims. Well, we know that a leopard doesn't change his spots. And I know that Ned's signature is all over this crime scene, all over it. But my instincts aren't proof. It was the same with Karen Osmond's mother, who was certain Snellgrove killed her daughter, but had no evidence. Until he struck again. In August 1987, 44-year-old Mary Ellen Renard attended a New Jersey singles event where she was flattered by the attentions of a polite, much younger man. He bought her a drink and asked her to dance, but she left the bar alone. Snellgrove followed her, but this time had his luck run out. Mary Ellen tries to fight her way down the stairs. She manages to break free from him.
I'm looking back over the crimes of Ned Snellgrove to see if I can link him to the unsolved 1982 murder of Jane Goodwin. In 1983, Snellgrove killed his ex-girlfriend, Karen Osmond. But at the time, no physical evidence connected him, and he walked free. Then, in 1987, he attacked Mary Ellen Renard, but she managed to escape and ran straight to police. Snellgrove was charged with attempted murder, but no one was prepared for what happened next. I was stunned when his attorney came to me and indicated that he would be willing to plead to Karen Osmond's murder. I'm with Fred Schwanwee, who prosecuted the Mary Ellen Renard case. For a defendant to come forward and admit to a homicide that had been open for many years with no prospect of being solved, that's extraordinary. Do you believe he had an ulterior motive to that? He was thinking that at some point in the future, either there might be a technology that would be developed, a DNA type of technology or something else that would place him at the scene or help convince a jury that he was guilty. Snellgrove was smart because he knew that by admitting to Karen's murder now, he could avoid a life sentence or even the death penalty if found guilty later on. The prosecution accepted the deal. The main motivating factor for us was that we wanted to bring closure to Karen Osmond's family. Snellgrove confessed to killing Karen and attacking Mary Ellen in exchange for a 20-year sentence. He'd be eligible for parole after only 11 years. Smart like a fox, Ned Snellgrove. In 1988, Snellgrove started serving his sentence here at the East Jersey State Prison in Woodbridge. But Fred Schwanweed says Ned stayed on his mind for one very sinister reason. Ned was dangerous precisely because he didn't look like a bad guy. I mean, we all go to the movies, we go to, uh, we watch TV shows, and you always see the same actors playing the bad guy because they look like bad guys. They have the kind of face. Ned was just the opposite. Ned had the kind of face that you would say to yourself, Eagle Scout. Uh, he was a handsome guy, he was a personable guy, very bright, and none of the alarms would go off. He didn't have any characteristics that, that would raise a, a woman's uh, awareness to a level where she would uh, defend herself against him. So when Snellgrove's sentence came up for review, Fred Schwanweed sent out a warning. Well, I, I told the parole board, Ed Snellgrove was the most dangerous defendant that uh, I have ever dealt with in the criminal justice system. I believe that he might do something like this again whenever he was released, even if he was released after 20 years, that there was a real danger that he was going to do something like this again. Fred Schwanweed saw how deadly Snellgrove was, so why didn't others? I'm thinking profiler John Kelly can explain. He's able to fly under the radar because when he needs to, he can become a chameleon and he can switch on that mask of sanity. That's funny because his surviving victim, right, says he went into the bathroom. When he came out, he even looked different. He became another person. This guy walks around as a charmer with the mask of sanity on, getting along with everybody. But inside, you have this volcanic rage wow. that is just bubbling, and finally, it explodes. This volcanic rage comes out. And who does it come out on? Helpless women. Kelly is describing the classic psychopathic killer. Charming on the surface, deadly underneath just like another murderer we know, 13. Bottom line, even though, in a way, he's a colleague of ours and helps us on these cases, 
we are dealing with a psychopath. And we must never forget that. I couldn't forget if I tried. But if 13 can help me get inside Snellgrove's mind, I'll play along. Okay, John. Knock yourself out. Well, thank you so much. 13's had my case files on Snellgrove for weeks now. So can he give us some more insight? You know, but, but this guy here, he probably doesn't talk very much. He, uh, he fantasizes about this all day long at work. Look, he's always fantasizing, okay. Uh, his fetish is, uh, he's very ashamed of it. Doesn't want people knowing. That's it. 13's right on the money again, because Snellgrove fantasized all the time. During his trial in 1988, he sent a chilling letter to the judge. He wrote that every time he saw a woman he liked, he imagined strangling her or hitting her over the head, carrying her limp body to a bed, undressing her and arranging her arms and legs in some kind of seductive pose. Later, in prison, an even more disturbing fantasy emerged in his letters to an old friend. He began to model himself on America's most notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. You see, Snellgrove may have known how to wear the mask of sanity, but Ted Bundy was the master of it. Between 1974 and 1978, he charmed as many as 50 young women into believing he was just a regular guy before revealing the monster within and murdering them all. Bundy became Ned's pinup boy. He's studying Ted Bundy's books. He's studying Ted Bundy's life. And then he starts writing to a friend of his. And if I may, I'd like to quote from one of those letters. Bundy's way of going about it, his M.O., is a textbook for what I should have done in order to avoid arrest. He planned his crimes. Bundy planned his crimes. Ned's telling himself, I need to plan better in order to be what? To be the perfect killer. In 1999, Snellgrove was up for parole. Would he now be given a shot at trying to measure up to Bundy? I'd have to think it's a heck of a coincidence and you have a serial killer in the same location as this poor woman that gets killed. Explore more online at investigation.discovery.com forward slash dark minds. In 1988, Ned Snellgrove confessed to the 1983 murder of Karen Osmond and the 1987 attack on Mary Ellen Renard. He was sentenced to 20 years for both crimes. But after only 11, he was up for parole. Despite the grave warnings of prosecutor Fred Schwanweed and the sick fantasies revealed in Snellgrove's own letters, he was released. Ned went home to Connecticut. Right here in this house, this is where Ned moved when he got out of prison. He lived in the basement. His parents lived upstairs. And this is the place where Ned Snellgrove fantasized about being better than Bundy. Snellgrove got a job as a traveling salesman, selling frozen meat to housewives and his dark thoughts traveled with him. It wasn't long before they got the best of him. Snellgrove became a regular at a bar in downtown Hartford, Connecticut. 
32-year-old Carmen Rodriguez also liked to hang out there. She got to know Snellgrove well enough for chit-chat. Then, one night in September 2001, it went further, and they left together. There's no physical proof of what happened next. But a cellmate Snellgrove allegedly bragged to while in jail on separate charges later testified to what he says occurred here at this fairground in nearby Berlin. So this is the Berlin fairgrounds. This is where families come, have fun, eat cotton candy. And this is also where Ned Snellgrove brought Carmen Rodriguez for her last ride. And they come down the street right here, and Carmen thinks she's just going to party a little bit with Ned. And they pull in here, and Ned drives back to that woods over there. And he starts in with Carmen, and he grabs her around the throat, and she gets away. And she runs into the woods, running for her life. And Ned tackles her. He drags her back to the car, like that, where he puts her on the back seat on a tarp, and he starts stabbing her. And when he's done, he hog ties Carmen. Puts her in garbage bags, puts her in the trunk of his car, and then he takes back off, and he heads out to Rhode Island. For four months, Carmen's family suffered in agony, praying that their daughter would be found. And then, in January 2002, she was. In January, in rural Rockville, Rhode Island, a body was discovered, the body of Carmen Rodriguez of Hartford, missing since September when she was seen with Ned Snellgrove. One of the detectives who worked the case, Steve Malikas, is meeting me here, outside the downtown bar where Carmen was last seen. Steve, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? How you doing? When Carmen went missing, Malikas checked out all the regulars at the bar. And something about Snellgrove made alarm bells go off. Every time he went to the bar, he would park right where that red car was. And then he uh, stopped going after Carmen was last seen in the bar. And then when she was missing, after a few weeks, he did show up. He didn't park in the same spot. He hit his car way down the road. His shady behavior and the fact that Ned had left the bar with Carmen got law enforcement's attention. Cops searched his home, and what they found was straight out of a horror movie. So what do you make of that? These are the mannequin heads that were seized inside of Ned's house. That was bizarre. We showed the picture to Ned what this was, and he's trying to claim that his, uh, his nephew drew that, which is not the case. The eyes are perfect, and it's right onto the, uh, to the Adam's apple where you would strangle someone and then hit someone in the head. So he's basically practicing how to murder. Looks like it. That's what we thought. Police also found a stash of videos, news clippings, and books, all relating to Ted Bundy. Then, Malikas interviewed Snowgrove. You stared into his eyeballs. What was that like? You know, my gut feeling was that Ned was, he was basically telling us, yeah, you don't know how I did it, and I did it, and you know I did it, but you don't know how I did it, and he was happy with that. It was almost like a cat and mouse game. He knew, we knew, he did it. Malikas, can you give me your personal opinion of Ned Snellgrove? He's really an odd guy. He's very arrogant, and he's uh, intelligent, but he thinks he's smarter than everybody else. He actually thought he was kind of like a lawyer, too. Arrogant, just like Bundy. Cunning, just like Bundy. Maybe even stupid like Bundy. Because Bundy's fatal mistake was his own record keeping. And Snellgrove did the exact same thing. Tuesday, detectives searched the car and the house. In November, Hartford police took from the car what they thought might be clues to a murder, the murder of Carmen Rodriguez. Snellgrove accounted for every tank of gas and every hour of his life. But on the day Carmen went missing, Ned's figures did not add up. And then, those letters he wrote in prison came back to haunt him, too. In one, he wrote how he dreamed of selling his story after he was released. Except he wasn't finished killing yet. These were his exact words. 
In terms of the saleability of my story, don't think in the short term. Wouldn't it be a great story when I pick up right where I left off? He's self-admitting that he has a problem, and he's self-admitting that he enjoys killing, and it's sexual release. So, I mean, right there, that's a huge problem, you know? And then you have him leaving the bar with Carmen Rodriguez. He, that's, you know, he sunk right there, I think. In 2005, Snellgrove went on trial for the murder of Carmen Rodriguez and pled not guilty. But he was convicted and sentenced to life. In Connecticut, that's 60 years. The judge called Snellgrove a psychopathic braggart who was beyond redemption. The courtroom applauded. Finally, he was off the streets for good. Still, Snellgrove never stopped fighting. He gave this rant in court, imploring journalists, write to me, come visit me, because I will have the answers and I will prove that my guilty verdict is unjust. So I went to him. In February 2007, I wrote him my first letter. And I want to get John Kelly's perspective on Snellgrove's reply. There are so many aspects of my case, he says. I have no way of knowing how your curiosity was first piqued, and therefore, I do not know how to react to your interest. So he's fishing, is he not, Kelly? Obviously fishing. He's trying to find out what you know and try to get inside your head. So we're both playing a game. You're playing a mind game. My plan was maybe act like his friend. Maybe say, Ned, you know, I'm willing to take a look at your side of this. What do you have to offer? Mm -hmm. I don't know that he's going to turn on me, though. In my letters to Ned, I tried to make him talk about his past hoping he might mention something I could connect to Jane's murder. He wrote me back over a dozen times, but gave me nothing I could use. And I got the feeling he was playing me. That's when I got angry and demanded the truth. And I told him in this letter, I said, it's time for you to come clean. And I laid out all these questions for him. How many have you killed? Why are you a breast man? Where does that come from? Were you abused as a child? Did you kill Jane Goodwin? In one outburst, I unleashed all my frustration and disgust at Snellgrove, believing I could force the answers out of him. In February 2009, Snellgrove wrote me back and called my bluff. Dear M. William Phelps, investigative journalist, under quotes, I want you to go to this page on this date in the New York Times, and I want you to look at that article, and I want you to read it again and again and again, because that's going to be my reality. And of course, I dropped this letter, and I flew down to the library and looked up this old newspaper, because I wanted to know if Ned Snellgrove was threatening me. And all the article said was, DNA exonerates inmate and gets him out of jail. He was telling me that someday he's going to get out and what? Come after me? He knows where to find me. But I wasn't worried about that. I was worried this might be the last letter he'd ever send. And any chance I had at a confession to Jane's murder would be gone. John Kelly has managed to keep a killer on the line for over a decade. Can he tell me the secret to making it last? You have to look at what is your goal? And are you going to let your personal emotions interfere with your goal? Are you going to let your personal emotions stop you from gaining very important information? Yeah, I I'm just concerned that Jane Goodwin's mother, Aletta Goodwin, I'm concerned that there would never be an answer for her. Kelly's right. My emotions got the better of me. And I blew my chance at getting Snellgrove to talk about Jane. Now I need help.
from anywhere I can get it. And this could be my lifeline. Because for the first time, Kelly's letting me talk directly to 13. I'm William Phelps. I, I hope you don't mind me asking you a question. I tried to get into the mind of convicted killer Ned Snellgrove and find out if he killed Jane Goodwin too. But he got into my mind instead and gave me the brush off. Now all I have are questions. Maybe profiler John Kelly can give me some answers. He says Snellgrove is a classic psychopath. So what makes him fit the definition? A psychopath is a person who really feels no remorse or empathy for other human beings and who extracts a certain amount of pleasure, in this case, sexual pleasure, by mistreating, abusing, and in this case, killing them. But there's no sexual penetration here. There's no rape. There's none of that. So the sexual element of this crime is in the breasts. Exactly. But I think there's more to this than just a breast fetish. I want to know, why did Snellgrove stab his victims? Could that be sexual, too? Can we get 13's take on this? There's no penetration into the woman sexually, okay? What do you think about that? Hmm. Probably just wants to touch them. Okay. Do you think this guy's impotent? Hmm. I mean, this guy's all about the rubber body, the breast. He stabs them about the breast, okay? And that's how he kills them. Okay, bloodletting with a sharp instrument. But, I mean, this guy's not having any penetration except for the stabbing. What, what do you think about that? Tell me. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know? I get the feeling 13 does know, but he's holding out on us. I want to try a different approach. And I want to thank you so much, and uh, hold on one more second. Matthew wants to ask you a question. I got angry at Snowgrove and tried to interrogate him. I thought I could play bad cop, but it backfired. I won't make that mistake again. And this is my chance to prove it. I'm William Phelps. I hope you don't mind me asking you a question. I was wondering if you had anything else to add that we might have missed. The stabbing is the penetration. He stabs them as he's pleasuring himself. That's it. Wow. That's exactly the kind of insight I tried to get out of Snellgrove, but failed. And now I'm wondering, if I'd played it right the first time, could I have gotten Jane Goodwin's mother, Alita, the closure she deserves? It's all in a fog because, you know, nothing can be done that, that I know of, nothing I can do, and apparently nothing anyone else can do. I don't know. I don't know. It's disappointing. A cold case police officer recently showed Snellgrove a photo of Jane Goodwin. He went up to the prison and saw Ned and held up a picture of Jane in front of him and asked him, did he know her? Did he recognize a picture or some, some similar thing? 
And Ned just turned away and refused to answer anything. So. I hope someday Ned will speak up about Jane's murder so Alita can get some peace. As for me, well, Kelly thinks I've learned my lesson, that I'm ready now to dance with the devil for real. I've started developing a new serial killer source, someone I can bring to the table and give us another perspective to help crack cold cases. If I can pull it off, this could be the beginning of a long relationship.